Hey guys, before we get started, if you could please click that subscribe button so that you are notified whenever I upload a video, that would be fantastic. I know that a lot of you watch from the homepage, but my videos will not always be shown to you unless you are subscribed. You can click the bell button in there if you want as well, but the big deal is to actually be subscribed, so make sure that you do that. Also, this is the last video that we have to reach the goal for the Raid Shadow Legends campaign, so any help would be greatly appreciated. The game is really, really fun, it's free to play, the tribes are actually really sick. If you create an account using my referral link in the description below, you will get a ton of in-game currency that you can use, and you will get a free epic hero. Like I said, this is the last video where we can reach the goal, so those of you who still haven't tried it, please, please check it out, it would really help me out. If we reach the campaign goal, I will make another 40-minute long video on a topic of your choosing, so what I have done is... I have added a straw poll in the comments below that you guys can all choose what topic you will all want me to cover for this massive video. Anything goes, whatever you guys choose, I will go far and beyond to cover every single little thing about it and make it as long as humanly possible. Thank you all for your support, you guys are incredible and I am so happy to have such a strong, supportive community. Now on to the video. The souls she calls all come to her at last. They seek her out in sleep, drawn like slavering dogs on a scent. At the center of the dream, she shimmers to life, a dark angel clad in a gown of gossamer night. Not even the blackest shadows can conceal the pale curves of her moon-white flesh that promises pleasure beyond compare. In dreams, there are no witnesses to the indulgence of secret desires or broken taboos. No consequences but ecstasy. No repercussions but the steady, blissful erosion of a mortal soul. Everyone knows what a succubi is, so we don't have to dilly-dally too much in this intro. Let's just go ahead and check the monster manual to see what they tell us about this monster. The succubus page shares itself with the Sturge, so don't mind that side. In here we're told that these creatures inhabit all of the lower planes, and they can be found in service to devils, demons, night hacks, rakshasas, and jugalos. It's interesting that you do see this being a big question. Are succubus devils, or are they demons? But we will answer that later. It does say here that succubus can turn into incubus and vice versa, so that also answers that question. In here we're told what they actually do. They lurk next to a mortal's bedside and whisper forbidden pleasures. Sleeping victims are tempted to give in to their darkest desires, indulge in taboos, and feed forbidden appetites. This makes the victim more susceptible to temptation in everyday life. A mortal bequeaths its soul to the fiend not by formal pledge or contract. Instead, when a succubus or incubus has corrupted a creature completely, some say by causing the victim to commit the three betrayals of thought, word, and deed, the victim's soul belongs to the fiend. The more virtuous the fiend's prey, the longer the corruption takes, but the more rewarding the downfall. After corrupting the victim, the succubus kills it, and the tainted soul descends into the lower planes. It also says here that they only charm their victims using magic when it is their last resort, usually in self-defense. Down here we get that the kiss of a succubus does not feel satisfactory, but actually is the opposite. The person only feels pain and the profound emptiness that the fiend imparts. Lastly, here we get a very interesting diversion from past lore. Succubi and incubi can reproduce with one another to spawn more of of their kind. That actually used to not be the case, and uh, less commonly a succubus or incubus reproduces with a humanoid. From this unholy union, a Cambian child is conceived. Now that much was definitely part of the lore. Now on the next page, we get the actual stat sheets and the uh, PG-13 pictures for the succubus and the incubus. Uh, you can see here that the creatures are very dexterous and very intelligent. I'm, I'm glad that they kept that the succubus are supposed to be extremely smart, which of course they're supposed to be. We have in here maxed out charisma, obviously makes sense. And then proficiencies to everything that relates to manipulating people and getting away with it. We got some standard fiendish resistances here too, with something actually very suspicious. There is a suspicious lack of silver weakness in here. The devils tend to have weaknesses to silver weapons, whereas demons do not. And it seems like the succubus does not have that weakness, just like the demons. 
interesting. As far as abilities, they can telepathically communicate with any creature that they have charmed. They can change shape to any small or medium humanoid. The charm is obviously very powerful, lasting a full day. And then here we get a draining kiss that is mostly used for the succubus to finish off whoever it is that they are corrupting. And by finishing off, I mean to kill, to kill a person. And then lastly, we get the ability to become ethereal. Overall, the entry in the 5th edition monster manual was designed for the monster to be not too powerful. And you can tell that there is no way in hell that the DC for its abilities would be 15 when succubi are obviously sorcerers and their charisma has a plus 5, so it should be way way higher. You should also keep in mind that succubi are immortal creatures and most of them have lived for hundreds or thousands of years, so generally speaking the average succubi should be able to cast spells as high level sorcerers. Back in the older editions they used to be way more powerful, but we will talk about that later, just, just keep that in mind. But with that said, let's go ahead and talk about what the monster manual does not tell you about the succubus. To quickly describe a succubus, they usually appear as stunningly beautiful humanoids with perfect build and flawless skin. Their natural appearance, however, is decidedly fiendish, with large bat wings, sinister blowing eyes, and horns in their foreheads. There's really no further description, you guys know what a succubus looks like, so we can move on. The first question that we should probably answer though is whether they are devils or demons, which I know is something that most people would be interested to know. Thing is, the word devil and the word demon is more of a categorization of where the entity lives rather than an actual race. When you think of devil, you might actually be thinking of a Batesu monster. These are the monsters that live and exist through Bator, the actual name of the Nine Hells. Patesus, for example, are peach fiends, lemures, ice devils, etc. Essentially, an evil soul that dies and finds its way into Bator theoretically becomes a Batesu. Now, when you think of a demon, you really are thinking mostly of Tanari creatures. These are the Baylor, the Balgura, and the Glabresu, and others. A good way to see this is to picture Tiamat. Tiamat can be considered a fiend and a devil because she lives in hell and is now intertwined with its magics, but she is not a Batesu, obviously she's a dragon. Succubus, in, in this regard, are kind of similar, so what are they? According to Dragon Magazine number 417, succubi used to be angels of love back during the dawn times. Quote, In the beginning, creatures known as angels of love served the gods as heralds and messengers, comforting the despairing, the loveless, or forsaken mortals for whom the gods had great plans. They directed the passions of mortals at the gods' behest, pairing wandering hearts lost among the confusion of courting. With a single chaste kiss, an angel of love fulfilled all mortal desires, purifying the heart and cleansing the spirit of the woeful travails of the world." End quote. Throughout millennia, these angels existed and worked at the behest of the gods, but many of them actually felt like slaves. What they wanted was to make happy as many heroes and as many sorry souls as they could, yet they could only do so whenever the gods desired it. This is when Asmodeus came into the picture, way, way before he would become an archdevil. Quote, Though they revered the gods that they were made to serve, the angels of love also held great admiration for other beings, particularly the archangel Asmodeus. An angelic paragon of chastity and virtue, Asmodeus had been chosen above all other servants of the gods to guard the prison of the chained god, and there was no being in all creation that could question his dedication, his loyalty, or his honor. So when Asmodeus appeared before the angels of love, the angels heeded him as they would hearken to the gods themselves. Asmodeus showed them a vision of a cosmos where he had vanquished the evil of the abyss, where the angels of love dwelled in shining astral paradises, granting their boundless love and compassion to all they wished not merely to those the gods esteemed worthy of favor. The archangel showed them his vision of an ordered universe united under his own benevolent rule, where there were no divisions or conflicts, only endless virtue, eternal love, and ultimate freedom such as only the gods could know. The angels of love knew that to covet what belonged to the gods was forbidden, but Asmodeus was the wisest and the best of all the angelic hosts and his heed and virtues in service of the gods were as old as time, innumerable as the stars. 
though many of the angels of love turned away from Asmodeus, more remained at his side, tempted by his idyllic vision. In time, these angels joined Asmodeus' rebellion against the gods, but when Asmodeus slew the deity he served, the gods condemned his legions of rebels and imprisoned them in the astral paradise that they had seized. Here, the succubi were born." End quote. Now this, of course, follows one of the more popular creation myths that deal with the creation of the Nine Hells. This is the Fallen Angel creation myth. The story continues that the paradise that now Asmodeus ruled was cursed and now burned, transforming the once utopia into the nine cavernous hells that we know today. The angels were stripped of their angelic virtues and branded with infernal shapes. Quote, Gone were the halos of light that once had radiated warmth and comfort to the misbegotten. In their place grew a curved pair of horns, where once each trailed a comet-like stream of cold angelic radiance, now a serpentine, spear-headed tail twisted behind. Their white wings darkened and their soft feathers fell away, leaving a tough, leathery membrane like the wings of a bat. Such was the brand of the traitor, a warning to all angels signifying the price of betraying the gods they were made to serve." End quote. Their powers as well twisted as their shapes, so instead of being able to banish negative emotions and evil desires with a single kiss, and now their kisses instead instill the unquenchable desire that infuses every part of their being, a satisfaction that can never be reached. Every kiss an echo of the bottomless abyss that is the succubus's longing for that which is forbidden to them. Quote, Physical acts of love are the nearest these devils can come to the state of bliss they once enjoyed as angels of love. They suffer under an acute physical addiction, a sustained, insatiable desire for the touch of flesh that only a kiss will ameliorate. End quote. See, succubi instill a desire upon people, but when the succubi kisses them or makes love to them, that desire never burns away. Their kisses are empty of satisfaction. On the other side, the succubi are addicted to the touch, addicted to seduction, because they can never find that happiness ever again either. So as you can see, succubi hold a special place in the realm of Asmodeus, in the Nine Hells. However, it is actually more complicated than that. Succubi are not considered Batesu, but they are also not considered devils for seemingly a big part of joining Asmodeus' rebellion relied on a factor of freedom, or rather a factor of free will. They are not beholden to Asmodeus. Asmodeus cannot control them as he can other devils. The reason that the angels wanted to leave the gods was because they felt like they were slaves to them, and they wanted to be truly free. And, well, at least that much they actually did get. And now, the succubi are not bound necessarily to the Nine Hells, or specifically, they're not bound to Asmodeus. Some of them are imprisoned in the Nine Hells, kind of like how Tiamat is. But this is why they're not technically considered devils. Again, though, it does get more complicated than that. See, there are two succubi of great importance. Succubi that one could consider to be sort of like the leaders of the succubi race. One is Lilith, the Queen of the Night, and Malkanthet, the Queen of the Succubi. Both strive to become the consort of Asmodeus in order to share in his power, and in doing so they have attempted to prove to him that they have what it takes. In doing this, Malkanthet actually invaded the Abyss for Asmodeus and in doing so, she conquered the 517th layer and named it Shindilavri. She transformed the chaotic shifting layer into a version of the paradise that was promised to her by Asmodeus originally. From there, she rules over the layer and helps Asmodeus whenever possible, sending him tributes and giving him info on demonic lords. The Abyss, however, has transformed her into a, a form of demon, and now she's a CR-28 powerful fiend. Together with that, the Abyss has also granted her the ability to reproduce, and with this ability, she has created more and more demonic succubi, many of which now infest all the known worlds. Succubi which presumably also have the ability to reproduce, just like their mother. Unlike some of the other succubi which cannot reproduce, and this sort of explains why some succubi can reproduce and why others cannot. 
So to finally answer the question, this is why we have succubi that are considered devils and succubi that are considered demons. The devils follow Lilith while the demons follow Malkanthet. Now fun fact, Loth, the queen of spiders, actually snatches and abducts fiendish succubi in order to transform them into yoklols through a very secret ritual. She can only do that using succubi, which is very interesting. But anyways, uh, being a form of fallen angel, succubi can actually find forgiveness and redemption. Quote, even though all succubi long for the paradise that Asmodeus has promised them, they would sooner remain masters of their own way than return to bondage under the gods. A rare few succubi, however, truly regret their betrayal and supplicate themselves before the gods in hopes of redemption. The path to redemption is difficult for succubi to thread, and it leads to a destination that precious few can reach. First, the succubus must discover a way to leave the Nine Hells, then she must walk the path of atonement. An atoning succubus must live a chaste and virtuous life, countering every deed she has committed against the gods with seven good deeds. Since devils were created near the beginning of time, a succubus's atonement might require centuries to complete. Once a succubus answers seven times for each betrayal, she is redeemed before the gods. In all but the rarest of circumstances in which a succubus is restored as an angel, her form does not change. She is released from her sentence in the Nine Hells and sometimes she is allowed to return to the astral dominions that the succubi long ago departed. The succubus philosopher, Fall from Grace, is an example of a redeemed succubus. She serves as the proprietor of the brothel of slaking intellectual lusts in the city of Sigil. End quote. Now, as the Monster Manual stated, most succubi start the process of corruption actually through dreams and not through direct physical interaction. They will first try and have the victim perform his acts of lust in the dreams where he might believe that it is safe. It is only then when the person is utterly corrupted in the mind, then and only then will the succubus be fully summoned in the real world and start to entice the person physically. In essence, a person who doesn't hold back in dreams inadvertently summons succubi into the real world. Now, the most common way of dealing with these types of attacks is to ward the dreams away, and to do this, mages typically use the spell Magic Circle. The spell only lasts a single hour, obviously, and because of it, an addition to the spell is used where a circle of gold and salt is sprinkled around the slumbering victim during the performance of the Magic Circle ritual. This prevents the succubus from entering the dreams of the victim for the entirety of the extended rest. If such a spell is not within reach, then a more mundane approach would have to be needed. Since succubi are usually summoned into the world with thoughts of lust and greed, the creature hunted must drive the succubus back by performing charitable and wholesome deeds and clearing his mind of filth. Quote, Each significant act of mercy, charity, or love before an extended rest weakens the succubus' hold upon the creature's soul. End quote. Now, fun fact, succubi used to be extremely dangerous during 1st, 2nd, and 3rd edition because they had the ability to summon demons, much in the same way as normal demons still do. Thing is, succubi had the ability to not just summon any demon, but they could summon Baylors, which is unreal. The chance of success for the summon was 25% in 1st edition, 40% in 2nd edition, and then it was lowered to 10% in 3rd edition. Imagine fighting a single succubus and having her summon a Baylor right in front of you. She had a 40% chance of success in 2nd edition, I mean that's just wild. The craziest part though is not even that, but in 1st edition, the succubus had a 5% chance of straight up summoning a demon lord or a demonic prince. If you guys like this content, then uh, please go and uh, check out my Patreon so that you can uh, support the channel further. I, I would greatly appreciate it. And on that note, I would like to personally thank my Patreon supporters, Walker Motley, Sack Bowel, Rocado Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Terry Culp, Baracus Law, Omega Scales, Carathas the Bulwark, Ozol, Soundtech, Siri, Alex Cookson, Squid. 
Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Bosters, IO is Awesome, Falky951, Griffin Pierce, Siren King, Brad Salazar, Sabine Kurshap, Solarensis, Ordoric, Tesla Coil, Michael S, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, William Sladen, Drayden, Troll Skull Dude, Mr. Salty, Silent Shoppa, The Role Playing Junkies Podcast, Thomas Hunt, Jericho Darkstar, Major Fail Gaming, Soulless Rider, Shadow Raven Phoenix, Tactical Tokens, AJ Dare Music, Nathan McComb, Drag Logia 5, and Bushido Burrito for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope that you all enjoyed it. Uh, as always, just make sure to like and, 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 and subscribe and comment. It, it all helps the algorithm, which of course helps me. 